How long does it take a man? If a man ejaculates now, in six hours, the sack is refilled. <laughs> it's like saying you are ready to go. Uh huh. A woman, yeah. 21 days plus, for her system to be ready for yeah. that experience. Oh, yes. 21 days. Mm -hmm. And it's hormonal too. So at times, you, that's, that, that's one of the reasons why you have some, of course, there are the exceptions to the rule. Yeah. We've had situations where people are married and it looks like the woman is more hyper. Yeah. So those are the exceptions to the rule. And the reason we find that in some men, it could, it could be psychological, it could be emotional. It's not, that's not naturally how a man should be. You shouldn't be begging a man for sex, but we see it in a lot of homes. It's the woman that is even begging the man for sex. Something is wrong. They should dig deep to find out yeah. what is wrong with this man, emotionally, psychologically, and otherwise. You know, so in this case that we are looking at now, this man, this has happened between this woman and the other person. Yes. Sir. They missed it. They allowed proximity to cause something that shouldn't have happened to happen in the first place. And so I'm trying to use the opportunity to also tell married couples that limit your proximity to the opposite sex. Hello everyone out there, you're welcome to House of Utrance. My name is Obo Joseph and today we have a very special guest. You know, when uh, God talked about David as being a man after his heart, you know, I see Pastor David King as a man after my heart. I love him as a brother and as a friend. PDK, as I call him, <laughs> you're welcome to House of Utrance. <laughs> Thank you so much. Really yeah. pleased to be here today. Yeah, it's, it's really awesome to have you. We've, we've longed for this moment for a very mm. long time. And I'm so excited that it's happening today. So basically, um, there might be things that you would want us to know about you that I I was just so excited about introducing you. I didn't really mention stuff, but you can just <laughs> let in, let us in on other things about uh, Pastor David King. Yeah. Mm. Thank you very much Thank once you, again sir. for having me on the show. Um, my name is David King Etienne, as he already mentioned. I am a certified marriage and relationship coach. And uh, beyond marriage and relationship, I also double as a media producer. So uh, my company is into photography, lighting and video, and as well as uh, drone works. So basically, in a nutshell, that's my life. <laughs> oh, good, to, good to really hear that. I'm so excited to have you today. Thank so you. I'll just quickly dive right in. Um, when, when I began to think of how we're going to have this conversation. You know, most times we see, we just wrap up, like mm -hmm. there's nothing official about our relationship <laughs> and all that. But today, I just, I just want to know, like, what has the journey been like for you from the PDK that met God up till this point? Like, how has been your relationship with God so far? It's been a very long road. Wow. Yeah, so many things, so many experiences, um, but God has been faithful. Um, I got born again. I met Jesus Christ in 1996. Oh. And uh, the reason I got born again, I, I, I can't remember if I've shared this testimony, maybe once or twice. Uh, my wife knows about it, was because of my brother, my elder brother. Oh. Um, I wasn't the type of person who you could just catch unawares that you want to preach to. <laughs> I grew up uh, a Christian, Christian in quote, yeah. in the sense that um, we see Christianity as a religion. Yeah. Yeah. So that religion, I mean, if you go to sign a document, they ask you Christian or Muslim. Yeah. Basically in Nigeria, we have two religions. So they'll ask you Christian or Muslim. Uh, uh, and you say, oh, I'm a Christian. And uh, that's categorizing it as yeah. a religion rather than what it really should be. Should be. So, uh, yes, I was a Christian, grew up in a Christian family. My dad was a Methodist. My mom was uh, a Roman Catholic uh, okay. member. And, um, but sometime in 1996, yes, sir. my brother was in the occult, Whoa. in the university. I was in the university too with yeah. him, but yeah. I was in the remedial program. Okay. I, was, I hadn't started my degree program. So that was the only reason I did not become a member of the occult in the university. Yeah. And that's because the court that he belonged to um, wouldn't take any person who is not yet 
an undergraduate. Okay. So because I was doing my remedial program, that they had to. You were almost a foot in. <laughs> I, I was wow. more than a foot in. Wow. I was relating with them. Yeah. I knew them. They knew me, but they wouldn't legalize my membership until I was an undergraduate. So I needed to finish my remedial program before yeah. that happened. Now, in the process was when I relocated from University of Uyo, where I was then, to University of Calabar. And then somewhere along the line, my brother got born again. Wow. Wow. He was my wow. gospel. Wow. It, it was that bad that if, if you want to preach to me then, it's like my ears are locked. Everything you are saying was like pouring water on the back of a hen. Wow. But when my brother gave his heart to Christ, I saw his life change like this right before my eyes. Wow. And the day I made up my mind to give my heart to Christ, if I had known that you could give your life to Christ in your bedroom, I would have given my heart to Christ wow. by myself. But I thought it had to be in church. I thought it had to be <laughs> through an altar call. So I went to church that day with my mind made up that if pastor did not make an altar call, I'll raise my hand. I was that determined wow. to give my heart to Christ. And so when the altar call came, I didn't even wait to see who was going first and all of that. I wow. got up, I was there. Gave my heart to Christ, and the journey has been wonderful since then. Wow! Like yeah. the story is, is is a very transformational story. <laughs> like I'm I'm just I'm just wondering, like how 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 was it really possible that you had parents who were believers, and yet you got so close to the other edge? I, I don't know how that works, really. Just like I said initially we see christianity as religion yeah but um the per the person who gave who has given me the best definition of christianity ever since i gave my heart to christ was pastor chris Oyakilome. yeah and he said christianity is not a religion christianity is the life of god in a human being hmm. and so when we see that as what it really is and we have that interaction, that relationship with God, that is key and that is primary. A lot of us claim that, oh, I'm a Christian, but we don't even know the Christ through which we are calling ourselves Christians. Because yeah. I mean, the first time the word Christian was used was in Antioch. Yeah. And when they looked at these people, they didn't know what else to call them, but Christian, like Christ. And that's because they behaved like Christ. So remove Christ from the a uh, whole charade. We don't have Christianity any longer. And sadly, that's what we have a lot of times yeah. when we look at Christianity as a religion. You know, people bear the tag, but they don't live the life. And so living the life becomes key. And I mean, one of the things that has categorized my life, I mean, seriously, I walk into places and I don't look, uh, let me not say I don't look Christian, but it's not like written over me. <laughs> I don't try to carry it as yeah. something I want to put out there. But when you look at the, the way I talk, the way I think, the way yeah. I behave, the way I try to live my life, I try to connect it with Christ. Yeah. In what, is it giving? Is it relating with other people? What would Jesus have done? That is the key thing that makes us Christ-like. It's not what we portray or what we wow. profess. It's how we live. Mm. I'm, I'm already learning. <laughs> I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning so much already. I, I just want to backstep a little, like, because I'm thinking your brother, he's not here, but he was, he was in a cult and they let him just pull out like that. Well, actually, that's his story. Mm. Yeah. I, I may not know exactly what um, uh, battles he may have gone through to just walk yeah. away and all of that stuff. Uh, they are not things that I, I can't remember really hearing him share those yeah. testimonies. Yeah. Yes, he has shared his testimony when he was there and how yeah. he come up. But the battles and the process yeah. and all of that, I think that might be his story to tell. Yeah, def definitely. <laughs> if ever he, 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 he wants to share it. To, yes. <laughs> but, 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 the, but the other thing is, what is it that you really saw? You, you, you felt okay that he had become a new person. Like, how was that enough? How was that enough? Because that's, that's his person. Mm -hmm. How was that enough to influence you to now decide that, okay, you wanted to really follow Christ? Like, um, how, how, how that happened, I really can't break it down. It's because it's something internal. Yeah. It's something personal. It's something that, um, uh, 
influence and impact yeah. happens in different ways. And in his case, w- when I looked at his life, I may not be able to say, okay, this, this, this. Of course, they are, the list might be endless. Yes, Do you sir. understand? Because we know how we used to live our lives before we met Jesus. And I mean, the late nights, the clubbing, yeah. the womanizing, different things that we would have done back then. And then you just see that turn around. And you are looking at him and you, you cannot um, relate with the person you are seeing now with the person you used to know. And knowing that something brought about that change in his life. I mean, he just felt like, I need this. Yeah. That was it. Well, that, that's really that's really phenomenal. Yes. I think the Holy Spirit has a way of just getting things done without necessarily seeking for our consent in certain ways. Absolutely. Even though there's this concept of free will. But I feel that when the Holy Spirit is in your on your matter, <laughs> he's actually on your matter. So I, I, I can almost liken that to God just being God and doing his own thing in, in your life. I, I know that uh, some years back you had like a heart scare. Should I call it a scare? <laughs> and, and you jumped right back into life, into vitality and, you know, into that person that God has, you know, made you to be and also pursuing ministry alongside and all of those things. But, but can you just share like, how, how was it like, the before and the after like were you scared at any point that <laughs> something could go wrong you know were those thoughts like predominant on your mind or was it just a case of okay i trust god he's going to get it done mm. okay um maybe if i may explain better what yeah. he what he's talking about a heart scare i had a near-death experience and um and that's because i developed a um a a, a heart challenge where my I had a dissected aneurysm. If you are not familiar with medical uh, terminology, it's um, where you have the the aorta, which is the largest blood vessel in the human body, which comes out of the heart before it distributes uh, blood into the veins. Now, that aorta was calcified, was caked, meaning I began to develop um, elements like the um what do you call this stuff in our teeth now plaque okay okay in my aorta okay so my aorta that is supposed to be soft became hard and because it's hardened it begins to crack now understand this is the largest blood vessel in the body as it as the heart pumps it pumps blood out of the aorta so that also began to cause an inflammation because the blood was escaping through several uh, several, several uh, channels. Uh, channels from the aorta oh. so my aorta was growing in size and there was this fear of it rupturing and if it ruptured that would i would just drop dead <laughs> mm. normally the aorta is supposed to be like uh, three is it centimeters or thereabout uh, and then by the time it begins to get to four or five it's called a medical emergency, a medical emergency, meaning you are supposed to be in the theater for a medical procedure. As at the time, the hospital uh, checked my case because, I mean, I started experiencing some pain before I went to the hospital for diagnosis. Yeah. By the time they discovered what was wrong with me, my aorta was 10. 10 centimeter. Mm. Three times the usual. Wow. Uh, so uh, the doctor wow. was like, you are a moving time bomb. Wow. You can just drop down and die at any point in time. Now, the thing is, between when this diagnosis was made and when I eventually had the surgery done in India, where I had to travel to for the surgery, it took about nine months. After the diagnosis? Yes. Wow. Because, I mean, I had to raise funds. Wow. I had to get uh, my visa and stuff done and all of that. So that took a while nine months so imagine nine months walking about like a time bomb (laughs) were you a christian then (laughs) yes i was this happened in 2014. this happened in 2014. i was born again in 1996 like i told you so this happened in 2014. so yes i was a christian so what kept me throughout all that season uh was i concerned yes naturally i was was i afraid no I don't know. I just had this rest. I don't know. There's something the Bible talks about. um, uh, The peace of God, which passeth understanding. Please, uh, 
<laughs> I want you to ex- be, sincerely because I'm, I'm not trying to take you away from the story, but I want us to, after you're done, I want us to jump into that piece of God. <laughs> I don't know because, because I've been through some things that, man, I'm, I'm so, I was, I was so worried. I was, I was afraid, you know, and I'm, and I'm thinking like, I could have used a bit of the peace of God, <laughs> yes. you know, but just go on with the story, then we can just jump right into yes. that. Yeah. Now, it's not like uh, since then or before then, yeah. you know, at times we see ourselves like one kind of Superman that uh, we feel that, okay, I've gone above this yeah. in life. That's the dream. And that's what, you know, the life of God in us is trying to make us to become. Yes, sir taking us closer to the nature of God every day, every yeah. day, every day. But we keep trying. At times, I mean, like a little baby now, yeah. who is born, tries to walk, falls, tries to walk. Even when it looks as if they are perfecting the walk. This, I mean, yeah. I mean you tripped a few yeah, days ago. Yes. You would have tripped. Yeah. To climbing the stairs or just tripping. Uh, yeah. I mean, so even us as adults, where someone would feel that, okay, come on, you should have gained your yeah. mastery in walking. We still yeah. trip. So how much more? Uh, uh, so, um, am I that macho man? I say, okay, uh, the peace of God is there. Avail- I know there is the peace of God and it helped me during that situation. And the best way I use to describe the peace of God, like the Bible says, the peace of God, which passes understanding. I call it crazy peace. I call it peace that makes no sense. You try to define it, you can't. But it's something that comes from God per time especially yeah. when we need it and it puts you at rest and i want to believe that that is what took me throughout that period yeah. i didn't have seasons where i was perturbed How, come on that time 2020 2014 that was the time that was the year i spent close to six to eight million on Way my back trip then yes on my trip and the surgery oh. and everything i did not have up to a hundred thousand in my in my account when i was diagnosed so all that money came from friends, from family, from loved ones. It was just God that kept wow. my mind in wow. place. And we went through all of that season, came out of that surgery, and <laughs> it's been God. Wow. <laughs> I'm already feeling the intensity. <laughs> because I'm just trying to like, I'm almost playing back that story. To, to I'm trying to feel the emotions behind all of that and i'm really i'm really so excited about uh, the work that god has done and i know that that story this story is going to inspire someone out there them there might just be someone maybe with a heart condition you you going through you know phases of um, trying to deal with um illnesses ailments sickness and all of that and you're wondering how is god really going to show up for me and i believe that this story is like an encouragement to people out there that God is still in the business of taking people through. While you go through, he's still right there beside you, nudging you on to take the next step. And um, it's really beautiful. And, and this will take me to um, to the next thing that I know you for. Which, Can I add this? Okay, go ahead, sir. Before we jump into this other aspect. This is really humbling for me to say. Really, really humbling. Now, this was someone who was like the doctors put it, a walking time bomb. In other words, you could drop dead any minute. And this is 2023 or 2024 we are in now. That's uh, 2014. That's about About 10 years. 10 years, yeah. From that incident. I know a lot of people who at that time appeared healthy, looked strong, looked good. But today, we are no more. I'm still here. Will you ask me why? I don't have the slightest clue to that question. I don't know why God spared my life and why I'm still here. I know definitely there's a reason and a purpose for why I'm still here, breathing this God's air and doing the little bit I can, you know, when it has to do with life and humanity. But it humbles me to think about it, that people who didn't appear like they had any issue then Strong, walking around. Today they are no more. But I'm still here. It's humbling, really. Wow. It's, it's really humbling. <laughs> I, I think much of the time we, we, don't, we don't learn to number our days. 
Sometimes we wake up and we feel like we own the day. We don't commit things into the hands of God. We are not even, we don't express gratitude to God gratitude. For, for that opportunity. So I, I also want to borrow a leaf from you to say that it is humbling. <laughs> <laughs> it's really humbling. Thank you. I know that you've done so much um, in the area of healing marriages, restoring hope to marriages, restoring hope to relationships. Can, can you give us like a backstory? How, how did that become part of your story? <laughs> how did it become part of my story? Mm. It's amazing. I, I, I may not be able to put a pin on it. Yeah. It just happened. You see, at times in life, we think we have all the answers. Yeah. So that's why um, I'm very particular about when I hear people say, um, God told me, God told me, God told me, God told me. Um, that statement, God told me, a lot of times could be very concerning in the sense that I know a lot of people who have not the slightest idea what it means when you say God told me. Yeah. Uh, they never hear from God. They don't know. So when somebody sits next to them and say, yeah. God told me, like, how does this God talk? <laughs> <say?"> <laughs> we see a little drama yeah. in the, in the yeah. Bible where a young man, Samuel, you know, was called by God in yeah. his sleep and he woke up and he ran to his master, Eli, and said, yeah, uh, I heard your voice and Eli, I didn't call you. And it happened three times. Yeah. And uh, the last time Eli understood what was happening and he said, if you hear the voice again, say, speak Lord, your servant hear it. Yeah. That was Eli giving him some kind of directions. Yeah. And a lot of times we don't have those kind of directions these yeah. days. Yeah. We go to church and all we are hearing is God told me, God told me, God told me. Uh, the how, how, one is led into all of that. Yeah. It's like a mystery. It's like a myth to a lot of people. Yeah. You know, so um, I usually would tell people, I say, um, the fastest route to getting to understand the voice of God is growing in a relationship with him. And somebody say, what do you mean by that? I'm like, okay. If my phone rings now and I pick it up, and I hear the voice of my wife. It doesn't matter if she used her number or not. Yeah. I know that's my wife speaking. You would know. I have a relationship with her. I dare not ask my wife after she has said, uh, in fact, she won't even say hello. <laughs> she will call me something yeah. that she's used to. I can't be like, who is this? No, 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 no. It's not possible. Yeah. I have a relationship yeah. with my wife. And so I tell people, I say, if you want to hear the voice of God, have a relationship with him. And that relationship builds. If you're here now and your mom, you hear your mom's voice from behind the window. Yeah. You can't be like, you'll be like, ah, that's strange. First and foremost, mom is not supposed to be here, but I'm hearing her voice. Yeah. Because you know her voice. Yeah. You were hearing that voice from when you were in her womb. In fact, the moment you came yeah. out, you started hearing that voice. <laughs> yeah. So relationship is what builds getting to identify anybody's voice. In this context, the voice of God. So I try to build my relationship with God and as sincere as I can, I don't, I mean, you can't yeah. prove anything with God now, he's God. We are naked before him and all of that. So when I relate with him, my strengths, my weaknesses, I tell it to him as, as, as it is. I don't get into his presence trying to feel like, okay, uh, this, mm, 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 mm. he's God and I am me. Yeah. <laughs> so I've just built my life and my relationship with God in that manner over time. And at times, even when I think I've heard from him and I made a mistake, I still come as, ah, look, I thought I heard from you. I mean, that was my flesh. So yeah. how did it happen and stuff? Yeah. So it's just been a, like a journey. Yeah. Again, maybe if you are traveling by, 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 by road and you don't see everything about the journey. You know yeah. you are living, maybe you're traveling to Lagos by road. You know the road as it goes to Lagos, but you don't know what's happening 10 minutes from here. Yeah, true. As you go, the journey is, you know, unraveled yeah. before your eyes and you keep going. So one thing about asking me how I got here, how I found myself into uh, the marriage and relationship coaching as it is, uh, you know, praise God. Yeah. 
someone can say oh i i had a fast and god spoke to me this is what god said this god what yeah. god said and all of that for me it was just like putting the pieces of a puzzle together little by little the interest stage i just found myself being interested in this area of life i started seeing things i mean from when i decided to get married i saw marriage as fun i saw marriage as beautiful I, d- I was not seeing the negativity around like I was seeing in marriage. I remember when my wife and I were doing premaritals. Thank God, too, she also has that same flair yeah. that I have for marriage. We were seeing it as fun. We we're seeing it as something intriguing and exciting. We would go to class and we would take notes. We would come out of class and we we're discussing the subject that we've learned in class. Whereas I was seeing some other colleagues of ours who had joined premarital then you know, some of them wouldn't even show up for the classes. Some of them will show up and they're like, mm, I need to be somewhere, you know, yeah. and all of that. Yeah. So I could see that enthusiasm. I could see that seriousness. Yeah. I could see the zeal, the passion in that area. Then I began to see so many things, you know, messed up in marriages, messed up in homes. And I would say gradually, I was just receiving a nudge yeah. from the spirit that, come on, this is your area. I, I didn't hear one thunderous voice <laughs> telling me, David King, yeah. this is it, you know. But like I said, a nudge, like the Bible says, you will hear a voice telling you, turn this way, turn yeah. this way, this is where to go. And then the conviction comes with yeah. that leading. And gradually, I began to embrace that area of my life, you know, where I would make help people, you know, become successful yeah. in their marriage. And uh, I, I paused a little bit. I yeah. didn't go all out immediately because when I was having that nudging was uh, shortly before I got married. Uh, but then I was single. And a lot of people would begin to use it as a reason to say, oh, why should I listen to you? You are not yet married. You don't have what it takes. Yeah. You can't be talking to me. You are single. What do you know about marriage and all of that? And so I just had a little pause until after I got married. And the moment I got married, I went in full time. <laughs> wow. but, but what would you say? What would you say is um, one of the greatest challenge to Christian marriages? Because I can, at my fingertips, I can count several marriages that started the same time I started, and there are no more mm. divorce here, divorce here, domestic violence here, beating here lies here cheating here you know things like that so why are marriages failing why are marriages failing uh, i would i would respond to that question in from two yeah. dimensions why are marriages failing um there are so many things connected it is like if i ask someone now what is making this building to stand yeah. Uh, somebody might immediately say the pillars. I mean, it makes sense to say the pillars is what holds yeah. the building and makes it to stand. But you see, the pillars doesn't exist by itself. Sure. Mm-hmm. We have the rods, we have the sand, we have cement, we have the Blocks. gravel. So many things yeah. came together to make the pillar what it is before it can finally say, oh, I want to give support to this yeah. building. So I'm always very careful when somebody asks me what makes a marriage successful. I mean, it's hard for me to say this, 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 this. So I would look at it as a contributory effort of so many little things here. The thing is, a lot of us are not willing to do those little, little things. (laughs) So we're trying to look at that big mega thing that we feel that if we do this, my marriage will become successful. It could be the good morning that you tell your wife in the morning. It could be the I love you. It could be the I'm sorry. So little, little yeah. things, you know. But let me try to answer this question. Uh, looking at some of the common things that yeah. I have found as uh, a marriage and relationship coach. Um, ideally, one of the things that makes marriages fail is... I'm looking at Christians. I'm also looking at non-Christians. I try not to put everything in a box. Yeah. Yes. Uh, And that's because um, we also see a lot of uh, 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 non-Christian marriages that are successful. 
True. And then we are seeing many Christian marriages that are, that not, are failing. So, yeah. so not to say that um, there are not Christian factors that makes a marriage success uh, succeed or fail, and not to also look at the other side of the fence that, okay, there are non-Christian marriages that are succeeding. And so, by the time, if I want to say, okay, um, for instance, that your relationship with God, now it's important. Yeah. Your relationship with God is important. In the sense that, for instance, uh, if someone, why do we forgive at times? We forgive someone because maybe we have that nudge in our yeah. spirit that, oh, forgiveness is something that is godly. Forgiveness is something that I should be able to do or give my partner, you know. The Bible uh, recommends, it. recommends it and also lets us know that the same way Christ has forgiven us, we should be able to forgive someone else and all of that. But if you want to use uh, as much as my relationship with God yes, has really helped my marriage as a Christian, because you see, maybe my wife does something and that voice tells me, forgive her. Mm. And I do, because I mean, I'm responsive to that voice. I have a relationship with him. But then, if I want to base my, the success of my marriage to that... Alone. Alone. How about the person who doesn't even know what the voice of God sounds like? Who, who, who might even say, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God. Yet his marriage is successful. And, and so, it's dicey when we are looking at marriage and we want to hinge it on religion. Religion is good. Truly, religion is good. But we don't want to base everything that will make a marriage successful on, on religion. That will be hypocritical. Because just around the corner, we are seeing someone who has nothing to do with religion, but his marriage is being successful. So if we look at it again, we have biblical instructions on what to do that could make our marriages successful. And so we can marry and see a relationship between some of the practices that those people out there who don't believe in God are doing and also what the Bible is instructing us to do. There's some relationship. And so we try to narrow it down and look at some of those things and some of those details and find out, okay, is it possible for a marriage to be successful? Yes, it is possible. But some of the time, we tend to uh, 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 feel that... Mm, Okay, take for instance now, the issue of forgiveness, since I mentioned forgiveness. Yes, sir. Forgiveness is not just a spiritual thing. It's not just a Christian thing. It is being able to let go and to tell someone that, oh, this thing that you did, I forgive you. Especially if that person re requests forgiveness. Yeah. So a Christian can forgive someone. A Muslim can forgive someone. It's just that ability to let go. Uh, someone asked me a question. He said, taking infidelity, for instance. Yes. Now, somebody um, cheats. And the person asks for forgiveness, apologizes. In some cases, they don't even apologize. And then someone says, is it possible to forgive? this person and I tell them I said depends on you and the state of your heart hmm. <laughs> because you see um, it's easy okay wow I told someone again let me let, wow. let me say this <laughs> 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 I'm trying to put so many things together in my head um, in some cases someone says uh, we can forgive but we cannot can forget, forget. I understand that terminology. It's easy to forgive, but it's not easy to forget. Uh, now, let me ask a question. If you think you forgave, but you cannot forget, it's very possible that you did not forgive in the first place. Yeah. Because it's like a trigger. Yeah. So we say it, but that's not it. Sometime, at some point, that pain it awakens, back. it comes back. Yeah. That depression, that frustration. And you find out that that bitterness is still there. So if you say you forgive and you cannot forget, there's a question mark. Around the forgiveness. Around the forgiveness. Somebody say, okay, 
So how do you forgive and forget? And I say it's hypocritical also to say <laughs> you now remove it, remove the actions. Yes, your, your memory top. is not yours to tweak. Yeah. You don't have a server where you say, okay, you just dig, dig up it out. stuff. So when I try to counsel people, I try to give them a little recipe to help that process, because it's a process. It's not something that happens overnight. And I tell them, I say, okay, you remember when you got married to this person in the first place? There were certain things you liked about this person. What are those things? A lot of times they forget. And the reason they forget is because they are overwhelmed by this the issues at hand. issue at hand. So they don't even remember those things that got them connected to their partner in the first place. So I say, let's, let's do some assignments. So write down, what are those things you used to like about this person? Are they still there? A lot of times they are still there. And so the question is, can you begin what I call replacement? <laughs> wow. replacement is a process wow. a lot of people are not willing mm. to go through that process they feel that it will just happen automatic mm -mm. there's work in it so can you begin to replace those thoughts those things and a lot of times that replacement comes through verbalization it's not easy again but then the more you do it the more it begins something Come on. happens okay. On your inside now here's the thing there's this question the bible even asked it does a baby know how the bones grew formed. while it was being formed and the bible answered the question no but here's the thing it just occurred to you that, ooh, I've outgrown my shirt. Yeah. You didn't see the process of the growth. You didn't see mm. your bones shooting out. But all the while, something, something has happening. been happening in you. Sure. Then one day you went to your wardrobe, picked your shirt, you put it on. Ah, I've added weight. <laughs> I can't wear this. Yeah. So change happens within us all the time, depending on the information that we are exposed to and the transformation that we allow it to happen to us. Over time, it just dawns on you that, oh, come on, I'm no longer bitter, even when you try to be. You just realize that something has happened, yeah. some change, some transformation has happened. And that's because you were yielding to the work that needed to make it happen. Yeah, so speaking, speaking of forgiveness, <clears throat> this is a true life story. A guy and his wife, they have issues. They've been having a lot of um, marital challenges, money issues, issues of being present in the home, financial challenges. And it gets to a point where the woman is shouldering a lot of weight in the home. So she begins to confide in a certain man. The husband knows the person. The person has always been like a friend to the to the man's wife then maybe on a weekend after work they go for drinks one thing leads to another and they have sex or better yet the woman says it was not necessarily consensual sex but it was rape she doesn't hide it from her husband mm -hmm. she informs him and the guy is at that point where he doesn't really necessarily know what to do. What should he do? What should he do? Yeah. Uh, well, we are referring to both parties now. Yes. Mm. Uh, these situations are very dicey. Now, first and foremost, they have to talk. We don't have such situations and all we're doing is pointing fingers, the yeah. blame game. Yes. When we ever get to that situation, I usually would tell people, I say, where there's cheating involved in a relationship, um, let's stop addressing the what yeah. and start asking questions as to the 
why there's always a why now um does the why justify no 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 not okay. at all okay not at all okay not at all the why does not justify the reason why it is done in the first place yeah. but there's a why <laughs> there has to be a why. And um, if the why is not dealt, dealt with, with, it will happen again. No matter how sorry one person may feel or look, the why has to be dealt with. So this lady was finding herself comfortable around the other guy. And uh, I don't know, maybe it was whatever it is they were doing. I usually would tell people that um, uh, sex doesn't just happen. Mm -mm. So when I hear people say, oh, I don't know how it happened. Mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. You are the first route to, uh, what's the yeah. word now? To, uh, uh, there's this word. I'm really looking for that word. Uh, when something has the potential, uh, the first route to potential sex happening hmm. is proximity. Wow. You can't, you can't have sex with a ghost. Mm, you can't have sex with a ghost. <laughs> Proximity. Yeah. What are in your place of work? Yeah. You just find out that mm, there's this person that uh, anytime they tell you good morning, you get as they do you. Yeah. You know, once in a while, uh, the fact that you're even just going to work to sit next to this person, uh, yeah. something is, you, you, you're just, the moment you begin yeah. to identify that, ah, there's a feeling I'm getting in this direction. Yeah. Begin to do something intentional about it. I don't mean resign. In some cases, if it has to get to that, fine. Where you tell yourself, mm, I can't stay with this, within this environment. Yeah. But if you, if you don't necessarily have to go through that route, begin to put some checks and balances in place. Uh, for instance, I hardly ever chat with a woman of the opposite sex beyond a particular time of the day. Oh. I might see your chat, I might get into it, but I will not reply because that is an inappropriate time for me to have a, a chat yeah. or a conversation with someone of the opposite sex. That's, those are my personal rules. <laughs> so you begin to put some of those checks and balances, some of those boundaries, you create them. I mean, um, some people, depending on your relation with some people, they, they can feel free to hug you like this and yeah. all of that. Some people, I will never <laughs> hug you that. Even if I see you coming, I give you the side. You see, we need to be realistic. Yeah. A man wakes up in the morning, the way men behave and the way men, women behave, and not, a lot of times it appears women are, uh, I don't know, how do I put it now? They are late to identify these feelings than men. So most times you find women uh, not easily being promiscuous than men. Yeah. But a lot of the times, men, we are very uh, physical, if I may use that yeah. word. And uh, I usually tell people, I said, it's not far-fetched why men behave that way. Biology even teaches it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. When we talk about sex, we are looking at uh, the men's, uh, uh, the man's, uh, uh, way and lifestyle of sex and we're also looking at the woman's uh biologically now how long does it take a woman to be ready to meet because when we're talking about sex the natural reason for sex is for mating yeah. in animals that's why they have the male sex organ the female sex organ how long does it take a woman to get ready for it i think much much more time than it would take a man how long does it take a man? If a man ejaculates now, in six hours, the sack is refilled. <laughs> it's like saying you are ready to go. Another... Uh-huh. A woman, yeah. 21 days plus, for her system to be ready for yeah. that experience. Wow. Oh, yes. 21 days. Mm -hmm. And it's hormonal too. So at times, you that's, that, that's one of the reasons why you have some... Of course, there are the exceptions to the rule. Yeah. We've had situations where people are married and it looks like the woman is more hyper. Yeah. So those are the exceptions to the rule. And the reason we find that in some men, it could, it could be psychological, it could be emotional. It's not, that's not naturally how a man should be. 
You shouldn't be begging a man for sex, but we see it in a lot of homes. It's the woman that is even begging the man for sex. Something is wrong. They should dig deep to find out yeah. what is wrong with this man, emotionally, psychologically, and otherwise. You know, so in this case that we are looking at now, this man, this has happened between this woman and the other person. Yes. Sir. They missed it. They allowed proximity to cause something that shouldn't have happened to happen in the first place. And so I'm trying to use the opportunity to also tell married couples that limit your proximity to the opposite sex. Yeah. Because sooner than later, something could happen. So, but in this case now, something happened. The woman is sorry. She's the one who came to tell the man. The man did not yeah. discover. Yeah. So she's really actually sorry for what she did. And she has come to tell the man, oh, this happened and this happened. First and foremost, I think I want to give her some applause for that action where she could own up that, oh, I've messed up. I have to tell my husband. And she did. Yeah. So from that point of view, the husband should first of all realize that, okay, she didn't do this as to spite him or as something that she was having fun behind. Yeah. She just let down her guard. Something happened, but she's sorry about it. So how do we deal with the matter? He's very instrumental to their getting back again. If he tries to push her away, Tell her, I can't forgive you. How could you do this? She, he, he pushes her into depression, into hurt, into a state where she can't even forgive herself. To a point where she can even say, ah, okay. Uh, okay, you have, you, have, you have labeled me this. You don't want to forgive me and all of that. She can even go forward to even intentionally now want to get more into the act of you know uh, uh infidelity and all of that so it begins with the man in this we are looking at this uh, scenario. scenario yeah yes every scenario is different so i don't try to relate every scenario yeah, together true. so uh, this particular scenario she is the one who came to him and say oh i've messed up this, this 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 and like i said it can happen to anybody if you let down your guard nobody's a superman when it has to do with that arena just be able to identify those loopholes yeah create the boundaries and put everything in place and have checks and balances otherwise anybody can i mean we hear it every day on social yeah. media even with men of god i mean it's a sad story whether it's true or not that's not what i'm talking about but yeah. that the story can even come up yeah is what is I'm trying to let you know that it yeah. can come up at any point in time. So, apology. She has done that. And then the issue of forgiveness. He's the only person who can forgive. And earlier I said something about how to forgive, how to forget. It's a process. It's not going to happen over time. But the two of you have a lot of work to do hmm. to make it a possibility. Hmm. Something just crossed my mind. We're, we're almost getting to the end of this anyways, but something crossed my mind. Um, you know, we have... We necessarily cannot run away from culture and traditions in a lot of instances. Yes. Um, you would find some cultures where things like this happen and the storyline is that maybe the woman will have to go through maybe cleansing <laughs> or something of that kind or maybe the elders in the community they have to be brought into the matter like does does culture we're not speaking against culture yes but are there instances where culture might be that thing that prevents reconciliation between two parties from actually taking place. Okay, I, I, if you can. For example, now there, there are cultures that, okay, um, if, if a woman cheats, if the husband is aware of it and he doesn't inform the elders, he will die. Those, okay, type, of, okay. those type of traditions. Okay. You know, um, I see that as some form of impediment. If the parties want to reconcile, in their own way. Mm. By the time it now gets to a community kind of arrangement, it, it just it just has a way of complicating a lot of things. Yeah. Mm. Um, I don't like playing down on culture, but um, for me, I usually have some reservations, okay. depending on the extent of to the, what. Yeah. Um, by the way, I, I, I may not have the exact terms to 
explain, but I think there's a difference between culture and tradition. Okay. Yes. Uh, uh, there's a difference between culture and tradition. Um, but let me put it this way. When it has to do with um, the laws of the land and some of the things that we do as individuals, we should be able to have a demarcation. Because the law of the land is simply saying, this is how we do things when it has to do with this, when it has to do with this, when it has to do with this. And in as much as we are still from that place in the physical, there are certain things that over time we have evolved and we have said, oh, I don't go with this 100%. I don't go with this 100%. I don't go with this 100%. So based on that now, there's like divergence in what you believe and in what I believe. Um, in the Nigerian setting, for instance, we have the constitution. Yeah that governs the country. And so whether you like it or not, you are bound by, by the constitution. Rules, yeah. Yes. Uh, when it has to do with uh, traditional uh, stuff, I'm not very schooled in that, yeah. uh, but I, I don't think it carries the same weight like the Nigerian constitution, for instance. In other words, otherwise, I mean, Everything that uh, uh, comes with tradition of a particular place, everybody, what, whether you are living in the US, whether you are living in the UK, you hold it as you, a core. Yes. Yeah. So even within those environments, we see certain things are being loose. Yeah. yeah. When I got married to my wife, for instance, um, it wasn't everything traditionally that used to be. Done. done that was done so we can even see some flexibility yeah lots of within flexibility. the same uh aspect of culture which makes it uh, uh which makes us realize that it's not like it's absolute but some people try to want to make it absolute and want to insist for, for whatever their, reasons most times for their own personal most times for yeah, their own personal good, you know yeah. so we need to be able to look at all of these things and uh, uh like they say call a spade a spade so however you go about it from day one let people know where you stand you don't just wake up one day and you begin to say oh this is this this is this i don't and all let people know where you stand, where you stand. If they can respect your stand at that initial point, I think some of those later battles that we face will be dealt with. Yeah, then, then, then this brings me to my final question. I once shared a story of um, a, a, a woman that my wife knows and she was credited as saying, there's absolutely nothing that her husband would ever do or think of doing that she can never forgive. So apparently she's banking forgiveness ahead. Mm -hmm. So I asked her the same question. Yes. But <laughs> my wife is an interesting person. Mm -hmm. I didn't wait for the feedback, to, uh, for the answer to that question. Yes. Uh, because I didn't want it to sound like maybe I'm trying to look for forgiveness ahead of time. You mm. know, that kind of a scenario. Mm. But I want to ask you, is forgiveness a total lockdown for you? Like, can you forgive anything? Um, not even my wife, not just my wife. I can forgive anybody. Wow. You know, um, they asked Jesus a question, how many times a day? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Should we? We're talking about Christianity now. Yes. Uh, yes. How many times a day should your brother offend mm. for you to forgive? And that offense was not even categorized, though. Wow. And he gave he gave wow. he gave the answer. I mean, wow. the, the 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 answer sounded impossible. Wow. Wow. <laughs> We're talking about Christianity. Yes. Being Christ-like. Yes. It's not something you just wake up and easily begin to do. That's why we need the help of God. We need the help of yeah. the Holy Ghost. 
it's not easy. We will falter a lot of times, like I said, just like a little child who yeah. tries to walk. But let's first and foremost understand this godly life yeah. that we have. Yeah. If we understand it and the possibilities, we yeah. begin to see how, if I may use the word benevolent, God is in his love, his mercy, and everything. Yeah. So talking about... Uh, I forgive. And why will I forgive you in yeah. advance before you've even hurt me? You are human. In fact, I expect you to hurt me because we are different. Yeah. We think differently, we behave differently. The things that uh, uh, might uh, trigger you in a particular way may not trigger me. Now. So we are bound to step yeah. on toes. Now, the question now is, I mean, for instance, if I understand your strengths, understand your weaknesses, I know that, come on, if I do this to this man, based on relationship now. Yes, sir. Yeah, because a lot of times, if somebody trips on you, maybe uh, you're, you're in, a, in, a, in, in a plane or in a, trying to travel and somebody just steps on you and you, the person says, oh, I'm sorry. And you're like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. The moment you leave, you, you cannot be nursing that grudge yes. by nightfall because you don't even know that person. Yeah. So a lot of times, the deeper we are in relation to with people, the harder it is for us to forgive hmm. what they do. It's like it's a sellout. It's like, how can this person do this to me? So, but that person is supposed to be closer to you. So, a lot of times when we talk about forgiveness, it's, it's not about even what was done. It's about, okay, this person, you are this close to me and you could do this to me because someone out there will do the same to you and you will, just like that. Yeah. It's gone. You won't even think about it by nightfall. So, it's not about my wife I feel in advance because we are different. And a lot of times, like I said, if we even know the why, it makes it easier, easier. Yeah. for us to deal with the issues. But a lot of marital challenges that people have, they don't want to know the why. The, the, the thing that is paining them is, how can this person do this to me? That's, that's their pain. That's their hurt. And so they are dodging other things that are yeah. important and relevant to look at to deal with and they are dealing with other things that are not going to bring the solution what's what's the last thing what's one final thing at least for this session that you'd like to tell one married person who is going through the pain of betrayal just yeah. <laughs> married <clears throat> Marriage is beautiful. Somebody say, oh, with all the things that is happening out there about marriages, yes, it's happening out there. That's out there. Focus on your home. What do you want to happen in your home? What do you want to create? You are the architect of your life. You are the architect of your home. There's this saying, the way you make your bed is how you lie on it. How are you making your bed? Don't be distant from your husband. Don't be distant from your wife. Have a relationship. Be friends. Play. Chat. Just with each other. Be real with each other. <laughs> be real with each other. I told my wife the other day, I said, do you think that if a woman that is more prettier than you, and of course there are loads of them, mm -hmm, I'll be, I'll be pretending and lying from my teeth <laughs> if I were to say my wife is the most prettiest woman on the face of the earth. Mm -mm, not at all. I said, do you think that a pretty woman that is more pretty than you will walk past now and I would not have or feel that urge to turn back and take a second look? In, in premarital, that's one of the things I teach. It's a need of a man. Appearance. So for some ladies who don't know how to take care of themselves and look good, of course, they will say that the man is supposed to also help in yeah. that looking good and all of that. But beyond what the man could do or be giving to that woman to make her look good, there are some basic things a woman should be able to do. Is the second look, is it a sin? It's not a sin. <laughs> it's not a sin. Pastor David. <laughs> oh, yes. When it now becomes a sin is when I look and I now allow myself to be drawn by that look. 
<laughs> it's not a sin. <laughs> it's it's sorry. Sorry. I'm really joking because <laughs> men are wired to follow attraction. Yeah. Look at animals, for instance. There are many theatrics that you see animal birds yeah. doing when it's time to mate. It's the woman who does it, the female, not the man. The female does it to get the attention of the man. And then the man follows that attention. But you see, what you do after that attention yeah. is intentional. Wow. So at times, even when I have that experience, you know, a pretty lady walks past, and I just tell myself, David King, look straight. Look straight. <laughs> oh, yes. I'm telling you, look straight, look straight. It's called discipline. Discipline, yeah. Yeah. Intentionality. A lot of women need to hear this. A mm -hmm. lot of married women need to hear this. <laughs> So I tell my wife, I say, the reason I will never sleep yeah. with another woman yeah. is not because I am a macho man and that if a woman undresses here, I will not feel or have that urge to sleep with her. Discipline. Hmm. Hmm. Oh, I can talk about discipline Please just for do, a whole day. Just do discipline for like the next two minutes. <laughs> wow, well, because sincerely, because I've, I've, been, I've been wanting to convey an answer like this one word sir yeah the power of the human mind the power of the wheel yeah a man that understands the power of the human wheel yeah this may sound off to a lot of religious folks can live above sin Do you know what I said? If you understand the power of the human mind and the will of man, you can live above sin. Saying no to sin simply says, I will not. Even God respects it. Nobody gets born again without them activating their will. God cannot even force you to get born again. It is one power that God has given man that he doesn't take from man. The power of the human mind, the power of the human will. And when we talk about, um, the Bible says in the book of Romans, Paul was saying something. He says, I, I find myself in between. Yeah. I want to do something, I can't do it. The things that I don't want to do, I find myself doing it. He says, I find in me the law of sin and death. Another law in my members that is warring against the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. So it's like a tug of war. The man is di divided into three categories. The spirit, the soul, and the body. Incidentally, I don't know where that concept came from the same way our computer system is built where you have the software, you have the, the hardware, and then you have the operating system. So the operating system is like the spirit of man. The software is like the mind. This is what makes this, the, yeah. the, the, these are the programs. Yeah. And then the hardware is the body. Now this guy, the hard, hardware, is what has the contact with everything we've had. That's where the inclination to sin comes to. That's the part that has the nature of sin. Then we have the spirit of man. That is the part that was born in the nature of God. That even though you are not born again, we call it the conscience. Yeah. Every human being has a conscience. Although some, like the Bible says, are seared with an hot iron. It's like it's dead. But it's there. And every time, before God can access the whole of man, he must access the spirit of man. If God cannot get somebody's conscience, cannot get somebody's attention, where that person feels like, oh, I need God. God cannot break through.
Oh, the spirit of man. It's always there. It could be asleep, but it's always there. Then the mind, which is the soul, is the key factor that we all are looking for. That guy is renewed. Hmm. Because over time, that guy has always known the part he has related with, which is the flesh. And then you come with a new guy that just awoken from sleep, saying this is the way. So there's a tug of war. The flesh, the spirit, the soul is in between. It's like two against one. Whichever side the soul teams up with, wins. Hmm. And the soul is the seat of our will and mind. So I tell people, I say, if you can get the soul under control, which is teaming it up with the spirit. That, that if you've read this uh, lady's book, uh, Joyce Meyer, um, what's the title of that book again? Ah, <laughs> The Battlefield of the Mind. Yeah. Yes, The Battlefield of the Mind. If you can find that book, read it. And in fact, I have a book that I've written too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if, I'm, if I'm okay to talk about no, no, that book. <clears throat> Free indeed. It's a deliverance book. Is it out there? It's out there on social media. So, sorry, on um, Amazon. You can get it on Amazon. You can also get it on... Uh, uh, if, 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 if you're following me and yes, you sir. probably drop... Check my... Um, my uh, uh, WhatsApp. Yes, my bio. Okay. You get links where you can get the book. Okay. It, for now, it's just available on e-copy. Okay. That book is loaded, free indeed. All of these things I'm trying to share with you, yeah. it's in that book in detail. Free. It's a strong deliverance book. You can read that book and you can just feel the devil living. Mm. <laughs> wow. I don't know how else to say it. Yeah. It might sound as though I'm trying to market a book. Please, I'm not doing that. If you can find that book and you read yeah. chapter one and put it down, call me a liar if you see me on the road tomorrow. <laughs> wow. 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 This is a podcast that I would, I, would, I would listen to this podcast again, again, again. There are some parts that I'm going to cut out for my wife to listen to. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pastor David King. You've My pleasure. truly been a blessing. In fact, um, I, I know that this podcast is going to bless a whole lot of you guys out there. Please watch it, share with your friends, subscribe, follow Pastor David King on um, on YouTube, on his social media. Let's 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 see this as a seed that we are sowing into the lives of believers and in even the lives of the world. Because people deserve a chance to become better. You cannot hear things like this and you are not experiencing some form of transformation in your mind. So thank you so very much for being on today's podcast. I'm extremely grateful. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Thank God you for you. having me. I God deeply appreciate it. Thank you so much.